This is the Horse Radio Network. We've all been there, even Olympians. Those jittery nerves that turn all thoughts into bad ones right before it's time to enter the ring. This week, we'll discuss how to handle hardcore anxiety. Also, equestrians have a bad habit of going against medical advice. Why do we do that? And what are the repercussions? Thanks for tuning in. From Heels Down Mag, a podcast where horse pros chat about what's happening in the horse world over drinks. Welcome Welcome to Happy Happy Hour. Hour. I'm Justine Griffin. I'm Jess Payne, and welcome to episode 41 of Heels Down Happy Hour. Hey Jess, what's going on? Not bad. How's it going with you? So I have a funny story that you already know about, but so your husband friend requested me on Facebook this week. (laughs) No, and I might be part really responsible for that because we're watching the Super Bowl and Doug is a diehard Patriots fan. Like we have so much gear Patriot stuff. Even our son Hudson has a jersey with Brady that Courtney did buy him, which I can't believe she bought him a Patriots gear at all. And I'm I'm more college football, so it's like uh-huh. whatever. So I actually like took the short card, whatever you want to call it. I put Hudson to bed th- that night. And so Doug got to watch the game. He couldn't miss a minute. And so like I got down there and like halftime was going. And I love the commercials in halftime, like everybody. So all of a sudden the rapper comes on and he is wearing a fanny pack. And I'm like, I have no idea where my <laughs> phone is because I've just been putting the child down. I'm like, Doug, get a picture now. Get a picture now. I got, you got to tag Justine in this picture. And I like literally freaking out and he's laughing hysterically. And he's like, I got it. I got the perfect shot. And I thought <laughs> he was just going to like text you or put it on the heels down, like happy hour lounge page that he does a lot of stuff on. Yeah. No, he took it to a new extreme and friend requested you. I know. I was so surprised. I was like, maybe, maybe the tides are turning and we're becoming friends and he's not just <laughs> trying to make fun of me. But nope. <laughs> He's, it, I think it's a little of both, I have to admit. Because if he was just making fun of you, I feel like he would have put it in the group, like, Facebook page. That's true. And so That's I feel true. like he took another step and was like, okay, I'm friends with you, and I'm still going to make fun of the fanny pack. <laughs> Well, I hope he's ready for Kentucky because I'm going to be like his biggest fan wearing the most embarrassing fanny pack. And I'm just going to make sure whatever I'm doing is going to embarrass him the whole weekend. (laughs) Well, I have to say you have like, I would say like an avid follower. I don't know what you call her, but like the lady I talk about all the time, Wendy on here Uh sent me a Facebook message yesterday that they're now having this crossover like backpack, not a backpack, like a crossover bag that you wear like across your chest and it's a Crocs thing. So it's like a version of a fanny pack. And she's like, the fanny pack's getting out of control because she loves her fanny packs with you. And so now I feel like it was the, it was a shoe, like a Croc shoe. And it was like in front of your chest. It was, it was odd. It was odd. And I was like, oh no, this is now I'm going to have like two like frightening things, fanny packs and this crossover bag with Crocs. I don't know if so. I can I can pull off Crocs. I mean, that might be where I draw the line. But I, I didn't know if you were going to jump in on that. Like, I feel like that was going to be up your, your alley. Who yeah. knows? Maybe I could be talked into it. But I'm gonna have <laughs> we'll to send see. The we'll see. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. But just so you guys know, this episode is brought to you by Pup and Pony Co. We've talked about their wonderful, beautifully made products on the show before. Pupping Pony Co. makes dog collars and dog leashes that are equestrian inspired, but they also make outrageously gorgeous halters that match your dog's collar and leash. Um, And I, so I have one for Mikey. I have a halter for Mikey. And then my dog Josie has the collar and the leash. And I'm just, I'm obsessed. I think what color do you have though? Mine is like a dark brown Havana leather with a really beautiful white stitching, but then it has the the navy padding behind it. So you I did really the navy. It. It's mm-hmm. really pretty. So we have the red, obviously, like we love red. Yeah. And they sent us some halters to like see because, and then I, I secretly ordered Doug one. Don't tell him. He'll find Aww. out a little bit. But because they're beautiful. I was mm-hmm. like, I need one for Doug. So I actually bought one for Doug and everything. And it is cool quite beautiful. So they're, they're impressive, all of their stuff. So now my dogs get to match our horses. So I'm really excited. 
I know. I'm just, I'm really impressed by the quality of it. So I actually, I love the halter so much. It looks so nice on my horse that I ordered a dress sheet for horse shows that match it. Oh, so you're going to have to post a picture of that. I will. But yeah, I, I only ordered the sheet because it mat like the details match the navy blue on the halter. So like all together, it looks really nice. So I will definitely awesome. I will post a picture. Perfect. Well, this week, Justine found a really cool drink that I'm really excited to try. Is She found it for Valentine's Day because it's super pretty. I'll have to post a picture. Um, it's this like really pretty pink drink. And it is called a gin Campari sour. So I think it looks really excellent. It's Mm -hmm. one and a half ounces of gin, three quarters of an ounce of Campari, three quarters of an ounce of fresh lemon juice, half an ounce of simple syrup, one egg white, a dash of orange bitters and an orange wedge to put on it. And like, basically you just like combine out everything and put it in a shaker with a bunch of ice and shake it until the egg white is incorporated and I'm like really frothy and put it in a glass. Yeah. It's delicious. I I have to, do you like gin though? So no, that's what I was just going to say. So I am going to put a twist to it. And so I'll let you guys know how it looks because everything about this sounds amazing except for the gin. (laughs) I'm not a gin drinker, but I've found all these cool gin drinks are very easily substituted with vodka. So Ooh. like a French 75 is normally served with gin. It's now one of my favorite drinks, but I do it with vodka. That's that's interesting. I, I'm not a huge gin person, but I would I would like this drink just with everything yeah. else in it. But I would be curious to try it with vodka too. So yeah, I've been really like, like kind of like, I don't know if you'd say savvy or anything, but I just don't like gin. So every time somebody has a really cool, pretty drink and they're like, it's gin. I'm like, okay, we'll just do mine with some vodka and we'll be good. Yeah. Sounds great. So Jess, you want to kick us off with news this week? You've got some interesting global champions tour stuff, right? Yes. I'm really excited that basically the Longines tour is going to come into New York city and into Montreal. So I'm really excited that this tour is like gone to some of the most amazing places. So I think it's going to be really fun that two of the dates are honestly two of my favorite cities. Um, Montreal is by far one of my favorite cities in Canada. And we used to live right outside of New York city. So I'm really excited that they've added these North American dates to their tour. That's awesome. I mean, that's like plan a trip worthy. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like you could go and have like a, fun long weekend away, go see the horse show. But then you're also in like a cool city where there's so much to explore and see. Yeah. So like basically they start and, and go all these cool places. Like, I mean, if I had all the money in the world, I'd just go from every different city and like go to this tour because they go from anywhere from like Miami beach to Madrid to cons, like down in France to Paris. And then they basically go Montreal and New York in September. That's awesome. What do you have for us news? So mine is a little unconventional. It's not necessarily horsey, but um, I'm about to make it horsey. So I oh, found this- nice. <laughs> <laughs> I found this story on uh, CNBC the other day, uh, and we shared it in the brief. So if you guys are a brief subscriber, you might have already read it. But the headline is almost half of Americans shop online while drunk. Here's how much. Really? Money- yeah, here mu- here's how much it's going to cost them. And so basically, they um, this addiction recovery center uh, paid to have a survey done. So they pulled over a thousand people on how people make purchasing decisions, like off Amazon or whatever. When they think about like it's your your work day is over, you're sitting at home on the couch with a glass of wine. Maybe you've had a little too much wine. Game of Thrones is on in the background. And you're just on Amazon, or if it's me, I'm on Smart Pack, and all of a sudden you're buying a bunch of crap you don't need. I am definitely a person who is guilty of doing this. So Really? Yeah. So the survey says that Americans who shop online under the influence spend an average of $40 every time they do it. And I feel like $40 is pretty low because la- the other day I had a lesson like, I don't know, two or three weeks ago with my trainer. And she was like, oh, I think we're at a time where you could start experimenting with different bits. Your horse is like graduating to the next bit. And so we had talked about some bit ideas, but... 
I wasn't in a rush to buy a bit. Then I had a couple of glasses of wine. I like met a friend for happy hour and then came home and was home by myself for a little while. And then all of a sudden I just bought five bits <laughs> that I didn't what? need. <laughs> yeah. oh. So it was a little bit more than $40. But <laughs> I was going to say like one of those bits was $40 probably. Yeah, exactly. No, much more than that. But yeah. In buying those five bits, I did find a bit I really like that I'm writing in now, but <laughs> what, that was definitely I'm, a- I'm a bit person, so what did you find? It's um, a Miramar egg butt bit, but it's with the, the soft copper or whatever, you know, where so yes. it's really frothy on it. And it, mm-hmm. the, the lozenge in the middle, it's like a three-part bit, is much longer and wider than I've seen on most egg butts, and he loves it. It's awesome. Oh, well, that's should- cool. I'll send you a picture, but I bought that under the influence of wine. So (laughs) it just happened to work out. That's pretty incredible. (laughs) So if you guys want more fun news like that, you should really subscribe to the Heels Down Brief, which is our weekday email newsletter. We end every brief with our lastly LOL. And it's basically this fun phrase, almost like a meme or, or something, just something to brighten your day and make you laugh. And there was one this last week that just really made me laugh like literally snort cackle at my desk at work and so I wanted to read it to you Jess the lastly says hand me a baby horse and I know how to make them behave and do age-appropriate activities give me a human child and I'm all like so do you guys like to play with matches here have some chardonnay (laughs) I saw that one and I was crying laughing (laughs) crying laughing So if you want to subscribe to The Brief, go to bit.ly slash hdbrief. So I got to ask you, Justine, because I've been dying to know about what you've thought about since your Christmas gift. I don't remember if Alex got it for your for Christmas or you forgot and so you got it yourself. So I'm dying to know. You got a hunter pad right around Christmas time from Eco Gold. And what do you think about it? Because we use ours all the time. Like we have two hunters going right now and I couldn't imagine going at anything else. And so I'm dying to know what you had to think about it. Yeah. So I'm obsessed with it. Um, just to put it out there plainly. Um, I was to say, how do you really feel? <laughs> so, and I've always just ridden with cheap white hunter pads, you know, all, like all my life, because I'll just get like whatever cheap one from Dover, because I'm going to show in it, I, you know, I'm not going to use it a ton, but I, you know, I want it to look nice on my saddle, but it's not like it, you know, it, it needs to be a heavy duty pad. It's not like I show every weekend, that kind of thing. And I'm just, I'm blown away by the difference <laughs> in what I'm used to, to this. So, and also I got a new saddle for this horse that I have now, and I've had a hard time finding something that just fits it nicely. You know, like it's a bigger saddle. It's got a little bit of a forward flap. Well, there's so many that don't fit and then they end up slipping back and like exactly. get off every round and yep. you're like literally fixing the saddle pad because you can't wear a breastplate or anything in the hunters. So yep. you've got the martingale. That's not going to help you. So I find so many people that when they get off, I feel so bad for them. I, I like want to go up to him and be like, I know how to fix that. But you like, don't want to do that. Obviously that's kind of rude, but <laughs> it is because like I go and I'm like, oh my gosh, like I, this this pad and it seems exaggerating that a pad could fix so much, but just the innovation that's gone into it, I think people don't understand. You don't understand until you ride in one for sure. Yeah. Cause that's I know exactly what you're saying. I mean, the last hunter show I did, I was looking at the pictures from the, you know, the show photographer, and I just cringed at everyone because, like you said, my pad had slipped back and it looked so tacky. You know, it was just like flapping behind my butt, you know, and it was all pulled back. And I, and I just, I've, I've ridden in the Eco Gold pad twice now, and I'm actually going to a horse show this weekend, so I will use it in the show ring. Yay. And these past pads that I've had, you know, they have the little, you know, the little, whatever you call those, the flaps that, you know, are meant to hold it in place, like for your girth, and then you put one on your billet. Eco, this Eco Gold pad doesn't have any of those because it doesn't need it. Like I put no. it on my horse, it doesn't move at all. It looks picture perfect. It fits my saddle perfect. And it does have some padding along the spine that, you know, because normally I ride with a half pad if I'm wearing, using like a baby pad or a square pad. But this, and that was the thing though, when you use a hunter pad, like you feel the difference because you don't have that half pad at all. 
but the eco gold pad has enough padding and along the spine that you it just it fit it fits perfectly my horse finds it comfortable and i swear to goodness it does not slip at all it's like i don't even know how it works but no. it doesn't slip doug the other day was at the hunter show and we made a like the, you know, when like your girth is like a little bit like fine, but once we got to the ring, it was like at the top hole, honestly. Mm-hmm. And he goes and he goes, I don't think the saddle fits the horse. And I was like, or you need the smaller girth that's in the trailer and you grab too big of a girth, you know? Like, yeah. yeah. That, but honestly, so the entire thing, like saddle pad, everything, like it all moved because there was just not enough girth, you know, like there was just nothing to hold it, but it stayed with the saddle and everything. And when I mean, it moved, it moved like three inches tall. Wow. Wow. So, but like, there was not a, like you couldn't tighten the girth, anything more, all of this. And Doug's like, I think my girth is like, I think it's moved. I'm like, well, it's cause your girth's not tight at all. And the pad and the saddle moved maybe three inches. That's amazing. You know, yeah. it just, it just gives you that, you know, like people always say like, you want your equipment to be in a place where like you put it on and then you stop thinking about it and you start thinking about riding your horse. And I feel like you can do that with eco gold, you know, absolutely. it's just, it doesn't rub on the withers. They have this really innovative frictionless breathable material that works for that. And it literally just doesn't move. You can just ride your horse and know that your pad is where it needs to be. It is the bomb. So it's worth the investment. That's all it I is. say. Ask for it for Christmas, your birthday, anything. It is worth it. Totally. All right, guys. So we have a really special guest on the show today. And I think I think she has like the most professional credentials of anyone we've ever had on, a sh- on the show before. <laughs> but Dr. Gabby Ledgler is a physician from Ontario, Canada, who has been a fem- family medical care practitioner and a child psychiatrist. She's also an equestrian who competes at the intermediate and one star level in eventing. And Dr. Ledger is here to talk to us about how to handle hardcore anxiety when it comes to riding, whether that's um, in a horse show experience or maybe a fearful experience with your horse if you're afraid to jump or perform something specific. Equestrians of all ages and all levels definitely experience anxiety. And so we're really excited to have this conversation today. So thank you so much for joining us, Gabby. Oh, yeah, I'm happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Gabby, I talked to you, Kim Severson, who's a, you know, a professional and Olympian and idols growing up. I know <laughs> she's, she she's is amazing. amazing. Yeah, yeah, she's totally amazing. And thanks to Jess, of course, for helping me get a conversation with her. But I had a really wonderful interview with Kim this last week, who was so transparent and so very honest about how she deals with anxiety, um, especially during high, like high pressure competitions. Like she told me about this instance, you know, she's in Athens, Greece for the Olympics. Like, oh my goodness, you're at the Olympics. And she saying she woke up the morning of cross country day and just couldn't eat. And all she, she just felt like she was going to vomit all day. She's like that at every horse show. Like my first Rolex, my mom is like standing near her, like, idolizes Kim and Kim's like, I just feel so like they're watching. And you know, Kim knows, no, does not have any idea that it's my mother, obviously. And <laughs> goes, I'm just so nervous. Like, I think I'm going to go vomit again. And my mom goes, <laughs> should I be nervous? Like my daughter's about to go out there for the first time. Like she panicked my mother about the situation. <laughs> oh my god! And gosh. she's like, if Kim can't get around, Kim's been around everything. Like, Jessica, you don't look as nervous as Kim does. Like, maybe this isn't a good sign. And I was like, oh, my gosh. Like, this is so bad. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Uh, and I think bathrooms it's... Rolex Cross Country Day, those are not pretty bathrooms. No. <laughs> I, I run. If I have to Line pee, up. I'm probably safer to pee in my stall, honestly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're going to see the after effects of lots of anxiety. Yes. Oh my goodness. But, I mean... If Kim can have anxiety, I think it's fair for all of us to feel it at some point, right, Gabby? Oh, for sure. I mean, like, what greater professional is there? And how amazing that she's, like, honest and forthcoming with what she goes through, even at the very tip top of the sport. So, so what do you, I mean, how do you, how do you handle anxiety? I mean, it sounds, uh, I feel like in any sport, any competitive sport, any competitive anything, like, there is that pressure, right? And when is that? healthy versus when is that maybe unhealthy like it's too much because i i mean some people 
the pressure really brings out the best in their performances and, and, you know, they really uh, focus better than ever when the pressure's on and so on. And for some people it's their undoing and all of a sudden, you know, something that should be relatively easy for them and suddenly they, they can't do their job or they can't execute under those conditions. So I would say like, when does anxiety get pathological when it significantly interferes somebody's ability to function? Okay. That makes sense. So, yeah, that's a really good point. Well, uh, we're all going to have, you know, the the butterflies now and then and like the feeling a little bit shaky or like the slightly sweatier palms than usual. But that doesn't necessarily have a big impact on how somebody does. Whereas somebody could, you know, be having very few physical symptoms, but really not be able to do what they want to do on on the occasion when it matters. And, and then I would say it's a problem. Sure, sure. So like for Kim, she was saying like, especially on cross country day, it's really hard for her that she would wake up that day and immediately go, this is stupid. Why, why am I doing this? All of these doubts would run through her head. And then how she copes essentially is she just tries to focus on what she knows how to do. So she gets on her horse and she goes in the warm up and starts riding a horse and taking it one jump at a time. Are there other you know, exercises or ideas that you think people should focus on who, who kind of suffer from that same kind of pre-performance, like letting the event build up in their head before it's even time to go and do it? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think for a lot of people who tend to get nervous or get anxious, you know, they might have a tendency to really want to control things to keep those feelings at bay. And then the more you try and control stuff that you don't have control over, the more anxious you end up feeling. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really useful if somebody can recognize that about their personalities or their character and then put, you know, time and effort towards controlling what they really can control. So, you know, do a really good job of your preparation, have, have confidence in the fact that your horse is fit and sound and you know what you're doing and you're ready for the level that you're competing at. So work with an instructor or a coach that you trust who, you know, might even be able to to reassure you on a big day and say, yes, you, you deserve to be here. You're ready for this. You know, know your reasons why you compete so that you can remind yourself of that on those days when you're like, it's really early in the morning to get up, to go and like feel nervous all day <laughs> and then drive back home and spend a hundred bucks on gas. Right. Oh my goodness. But I'm glad you brought up, I'm glad you brought up the coaching perspective because yeah. Jess, I want to bring you into this as someone who has competed at the you know elite level, but you also coach people, right? Well, because so. that's what I'd love to. I'd love to ask um, Dr. Ledger, like, what do yeah, you so. as a coach? Like, I I don't know if you'd say I was like one of the lucky ones, but like I I have a, that pre anxiety, but kind of saying like thing. Once you get in the ring, like you get comfortable and you get going. But what do you say to kind of, cause mine's a little bit of a different situation. It's not to the extreme as for coaching people. Like, what do you see like from somebody that's like goes, you know, jumps a pole on the ground in the dressage or whatever else? Like, what do you say to kind of get them through that pre-ride anxiety, the anxiety of the show ring? Maybe it's not even before they go to a show before they even enter a show. Like, how would you kind of best described as the best kind of method to say, Hey, like, how would you coach somebody through this? Like from me, obviously I'm not a doctor. So what do you have tips for kind of the coach that has to deal with those kind of people? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, again, if somebody's riding with you and they're going to shows with you, they've already put their trust in you. And then the morning of something that's nerve wracking, if they're struggling with anxiety, it can be hard to kind of be logical like that with your thinking. So even just reminding that person, hey, you know, you ride with me for a reason. You can trust me. I know that you deserve to be here. or I know that you're OK. You're ready for this. You don't have to be nervous to be able to recognize that that person's nervous and to remind them of one of the things that they should feel confident about. No, that's a really good point. And just basically like reassuring the positive, I guess you would say. Yeah. I've had my coach look me straight in the eye and be like, do you trust me? Yes, I do. Okay, <laughs> you're ready. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> like, once you get there, once you start jumping, all the tools are already there. You're perfectly prepared for this or show. You're good to go. And even like those of us who like tend to overthink just about everything, I, I mean, it makes sense that your coach is not going to want to send you out there when you're not prepared for something. So that's an no. opinion you can really trust because it's bad for them if you screw up. Right. <laughs> yeah. And they care about you. Your coach cares about you. It's an emotional well, relationship. You know, it's mm -hmm. not just a transactional one. I think people need to remember that too. 
Well, I think Absolutely. as a coach, like that's part of my job, honestly, is like make sure they're prepared for what they're going into the show ring for oh, yeah. and make sure they're overly prepared. So it is just, I guess, reinstilling that confidence that, yes, we've done X, Y, and Z to get you here. This is what have given you all the tools to be very successful. This is yeah. what you like, you know, just reassuring it and not putting extra pressure on them. Yeah. Dyes even looked at me before and said, like, you pay me a lot of money. So <laughs> 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 make it worthwhile. So that's um I, that's great. Uh Rachel from our Facebook group actually has a question that kind of fits into this conversation topic. So she's a young professional horse trainer and riding coach, and she said most of her anxiety stems from wanting to make sure that her clients are happy. So if she's riding like a client's horse, are they happy with her training? Are they ha- are they is she doing right by their horse? Are they being honest with her when they're saying that they're happy with her work? She said the pressure that she puts on herself always to be on it and to make sure she looks put together and professional and leads to creating these unrealistic expectations, a.k.a. stress and anxiety for herself. So her question for both you, Gabby, and probably just you, is how do you handle your mindset when it comes to working for others and putting out a service? And she said she's often her own worst critic. Jess, do you want to go first or do you want me to... I'd love to hear what your thoughts are, or I could go kind of like what I've done in my experience. I guess it's up to you. Well, the first thing I think of when I hear her her describe her tendencies is perfectionism. Mm-hmm. And we, the world needs perfectionists. I mean, as a physician, like you, you don't get cut a lot of slack if you screw up really badly. You kind of got to bring your A game every day or, or you're not going to last very long. Um, but she needs to to recognize that tendency about herself. And, uh, and there are going to be certain occasions where she needs to give herself permission to do like what I call B minus work. Like she sounds like somebody who is going for an A plus all the time. But Mm -hmm. unfortunately when you're running a business and presumably she might be riding her own horses, like she's probably spread somewhat thin and it's really not realistic for most of us to be A plus, you know, all the time. So it, that can lead to problems with procrastination or avoidance or burnout. So just recognizing that she's always going for the A plus and giving herself permission to, okay, this doesn't matter. It's small potatoes. I'm just going to get this thing done or be quick about it or not overthink it or whatever it is to, to sort of dial down the effort. That's going to save her and like allow her to keep going on during the long haul. How do you handle it, Jess? I was going to say a lot of it is as well, like you put that extra pressure because somebody is basically in our sense, paying you to ride their horse and train it to your best ability and everything else. So for my advice to her is, you know, obviously this person has trusted you. You've done a good job with the horse. Like, yes, there are are highs and lows with horses. So not every day is going to be perfect, just like you said. And so take those days as learning curves. And Mm -hmm. a lot of times that like, if I want to make sure I'm doing right by my horses, like kind of what she said is I have a trust coach. I've ridden with her for 15 plus years. A lot of times I'll just go check in. Like maybe it's not my advanced horse that I'm taking in for a lesson. I'll go and say, Hey, look, I just want to make sure I'm on the right page with this horse. Like I'm having a little bit of struggle with them. I want to make sure I'm in the right path. And then whether I am right and we're going on the right path, or she gives me kind of like a, you know, sideways that says, Hey, maybe do this a little bit different. And then you're going to go much further and kind of make sure we're on the same page of like, this horse is what it's supposed to do. So a lot of times I'll go back and check in with Jan and say, Hey, look, like, just help me out with this young one. Like, let me make sure I'm, you know, making sure I'm doing the right thing. And so then between the two of us, like you said, you trust your coach and you love, and they're more of a coach. Mine is more of a life coach. I think sometimes that (laughs) I then she is absolutely that I then say, look, like I can have this conversation and make sure it's the right fit. And then I do say, Hey, look, talk to Jan. We're on the right page. Like we're good to go. And then I'm now reassuring my owners that yes, we are doing the right thing. So you've so, reached out to your support system and it's a you're, third you're party getting... validation kind yeah. of thing. <laughs> yeah. No, that's perfect. That's a great approach. And and hopefully uh, every young professional has professional mentors who have worked with them along the way who can give them that guidance and that reassurance. And I think that support system, like you said, like is so critical that, you know, even if it's not somebody that you've worked with for 15 years, maybe it's somebody you just, you know, respect dearly and you can go just bounce ideas off like that. You know, they're in your corner. Totally. Yeah. 
Yeah. So there's one more there's one more coaching topic question that came from someone in the group who asked to remain anonymous that I think is important to talk about too. So I'm curious to hear both of your ideas for this one after I read it. This listener asks, how to deal with anxiety in a trainer who may or may not misinterpret your anxiety. I didn't want to post, she didn't want to post this publicly because she was having some trouble coming to terms with that, but she needs to have things broken down and explained by asking questions and the lack of knowledge isn't an excuse. And she, and it's not just not knowing and wanting to know. So it sounds like there's some sort of communication error between a, a trainer and this rider, like when she's having anxiety, like the, the trainer's not, uh, is unsure of how to respond to it. So do you have... Any advice for this for this writer on how to communicate that to her trainer? I can go yes. first on this one. I would say when you're not having the anxiety, go up and have the conversation. Because a lot of times if you wait and have the anxiety, like you can't get through. Even though you're saying the exact same things because you're anxious and everything else, like go up to them and say, hey, look, let's go for coffee. You know, like whatever. And have a sit down and say, hey, look, when I'm anxious or when I'm having this anxiety, if you could do, and if it'd be great, like, if you know, what's going to help you and say, Hey, look, if you just give me five minutes or if you, you know, maybe say X, Y, and Z, but I think talking about it ahead of time would be the easiest. If I was having a student like that, if they came to me on just a very calm day and you could sit down and have that conversation, I think that would be the easiest for me in that situation. I totally agree. And I was going to say pretty much the same thing. <laughs> And that, like, I think as a coach, you're a bit of a psychologist as well. I mean, um, you you have to sort of be able to read what your students are experiencing and teach in a way that they can hear you, communicate in a way that that they can understand. But I think as a student, if you're if you're concerned that your coach, you know, might be reading your body language one way or your willingness or something, then absolutely. One one day when it, you know, there's nothing going on emotionally. We're not in the middle of a busy lesson or something. A approach that person and say, hey, you know, I'm aware that you know, sometimes I'm staring out of the ring while you're trying to tell us what to do. I want you to know that I'm not actually ignoring you or not interested. I'm hoping to get my heart rate back below 200 so I don't faint. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and like, you know, just <laughs> just saying it out loud and saying like, this, this is what that's about. So I don't want you to misread it. And you know how sometimes I, I don't know, forget the second half of the course. It's just that I'm thinking so fast that I've already gone way past that. And I might need a bit of a reminder part way through. Ask for what you need and then you'll get it. That's a great, great advice for sure. So something that I've noticed personally, I well, what made me think of this was I interviewed a young rider. Her name is Daisy Farish. She's had a tremendous year. She's 18 years old. She's basically won any any young rider USCF thing you can think of in the last year from the X to the from the X to the jumpers. Uh, she's just a, a, a really wonderful up and coming rider. And when I interviewed her, she talked about how cutthroat the big Eck can be, which made me think of the teenage riders at my own barn and how self-conscious they can be even with one another at the show. You know, like we go to a horse shows, they all go together as a barn and how self-conscious they can be amongst each other as friends and teammates. Um, and I'm just wondering if you, if, both of you guys have some advice for, for younger riders who have that kind of anxiety of maybe it's letting their coach down. Maybe it's letting their, you know, their team down I, or just how do you handle that in, in younger people? Because I do think uh, teenagers, especially, you know, uh, focus on that performance anxiety in a different way, you know, and they, they think about it differently when they get older. But I, I just see that in so many young girls I know who ride. Well, for me, I guess it's a really good example as I think being competitive, like is very healthy. It's a good thing, but mm -hmm. it also can be to an extreme. So if you want everybody to do badly, it's not a teamwork and it's very hard in the question industry is it's not a team sport mostly. So it's mostly you're competing against everybody. So you want everybody not to do badly, but you want to beat everybody if you're in that healthy, competitive nature. And for me growing up, I have three brothers and sisters and we're a very <laughs> competitive family, but in a weird way, like we want all of us to win. And like, mm -hmm. if we're first through fourth, like we brought home the gold, honestly. So if my sister beat me, like 
good on her. She brought her A game better than I did. And for Doug, he is the exact opposite. Like he wanted to be the sister no matter what. And I was like, what do you mean? Like, I, I don't care if Caitlin beats me. Like she was better that day. And so in our barn, like I'm very much, it, it is our, it is a team sport. Like you cheer on everybody. Like I want, and like with our young riders and stuff like that, I'm like, look, I want you to beat me every day. I hope that I taught you to become a better rider than I was on that day. And so we basically like do it as that kind of camaraderie where mm -hmm. everybody cheers on each other. And I think in this sport, in this day and age, everybody competes against each other and they don't remember it's a fun sport and you want to cheer on your best friends. Like sure. I truly want my friends to succeed. And so many people, that doesn't mean I don't want to win, but I'm very happy even if they beat me. And so I kind of been teaching that to our young riders that like, look, I hope you come out and you beat me. And if I beat you, I was better that day, but you can't, you know, like I want it that more camaraderie where everybody cheers on each other instead of being that negative person that says, oh, I want to basically beat them. And I don't care if the horse breaks their leg. I'm like, if you said that, no, you do not say that like ever. Mm -hmm. It's not about the negativeness. It's about being positive and cheering on everybody, but being your own competitive nature and that you bring your end game that you become first that day. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of what we do to our young riders and, and ourselves and everybody, honestly, in our program. Gabby, what do you think for young, for young girls who are riding and kind of feel that extra pressure? I, I agree that like the, the teenage years, especially, I mean, developmentally, they're a, a period in somebody's life where they're the most likely to make peer to peer comparisons, like look at themselves and look at somebody else and like try and see who measures up and, and analyze the teenage years. They're all about identity formation and kind of like trying on a, a persona and seeing if it fits or if it doesn't. And, you know, when kids are thrown together in high school, suddenly they're surrounded by like 1500 people who have in common with them a postal code or a zip code and like a year of birth and pretty much nothing else. And there is so much focus on where do I rank amongst these people? Where do I fit in? How is how is that person compared to me? So I think it's almost like expectable that that bleeds into like big at classes or young riders and stuff. And I absolutely agree that fostering that team kind of mentality is the antidote to that. Okay. So, you, you know, if you've got multiple teenage girls at one barn, you know, they can see each other, each other as like their competitors, or they can see each other as being on the same team against other barns or against other states or whatever it is. But that makes it, it turns it from so much of a, everyone else is an adversary to, like I've got people on my side and this is a, this is a fun thing that we're all in together it can totally change the tone. It's a safe zone. And like they cheer. And I was really proud of, you know, one of these kids that like is basically like one of our children and she went to <laughs> young riders last year and she went in and she cheered on everybody. And she's like, I was there to literally beat every other team except for my team members. And I was like, good Aww. on you. Like I was so proud. She's like, I want She's like, I want to be not the drop scorer. <laughs> like, that yeah. was like her goal. It's because it was letting <laughs> down her team. And that's what it was about. It wasn't about Olivia winning. It was about Olivia being a team member. And I was super proud that, like, she had that mentality instead of, I want everybody else's, like, you know, to be lame or, you know, like that negative. I'm like, don't ever say that. Like, so I just think that team mentality in the end even still being competitive is the way forward of being not that. Cause God, I mean, high school years are terrible. Let's get well, real. Oh, yeah. totally. Like, yeah. Don't take me back. Life gets better. If you're listening, life gets better. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> How terrible. I'm like, Oh God, no. <laughs> oh gosh. But what about from the adult amateur perspective? So I'm lucky in that I, I feel like I have healthy coping mechanisms. I'm not a big, yeah, I, I don't get very anxious when I ride uh, or, uh, horse shows or anything, but there are two instances that I can think of where, you know, it's affected me somewhat. Um, there's always like that jittery nerves when you're getting ready to go in the arena and you know, 
There are all those rail birds kind of sitting right outside, you know, the arena who are going to pick apart your ride, no matter, I don't know them, but you just know that's what they're going to do. And they're going to chat amongst themselves in the stands and pick apart your ride. And that definitely adds a little bit more of, of hype, you know, like my, it gets my heartbeat pumping as I'm walking in mm-hmm. the ring because that people are watching me ride. But so I want to talk to you guys about that. Like, how do you handle that? And just focus on the job you got to do. Um, but also, I there was a there's a really talented young writer at my barn who is um, probably, you know, like a decade younger than me, you know, like she's a new new college student, essentially, but she's very talented. And I've paid her to ride my horse when I've been out of town before. And she rides my horse better than I ride my horse. I'm putting that out there. Like she is a great rider. She has a great career out of her. She's very athletic. But there is definitely a moment where I'm like, you know, I watch her ride my horse and then I get on my horse and I'm like, damn, you know, because I do not <laughs> my horse as good as this younger kid. Um, and that, you know, that gives me a little bit of a blow to my confidence. You know, like I'm older than you. I've been riding way more horses over the years. But, you know, good. I, I don't I don't think of her any less by any means. So there's no negative feelings, but it's on me like, wow, I should, you know, maybe drink a little less wine and work out a little bit more or something. <laughs> but how do you how do you handle handle those feelings? <laughs> well, I I cannot wait to hear Dr. Ledger's point on the adult amateur because I really think I have some adult amateur clients that do get anxiety, so I'd love, love to hear that kind of point of like what she kind of thinks. As for like the young rider, like at the end of the day, somebody's always going to be better than you. Always going to be able to ride your horse better. And at the end of the day, like there are times That's where I've watched people ride my horses <laughs> and I'm true. like, yeah. And I'm like, I'm not getting on the horse that day. Like you rode it way better. Can I just like give it a, you know, like, and I've had my coaches, I'm like, I'm not getting on that day. And they're like, no, you have to, like, you're being ridiculous. But there's at the end of the day, always somebody better than you. A older, younger, doesn't matter. More experience, less experience, always that, that you just kind of say, Hey, guess what? That's why you pay them. Exactly. Like, that's it. But I can't wait to hear about the adult amateurs. Like, how do you handle the anxiety? Cause I know like a lot of ladies and that, like they do get nervous. So how do you oh, totally. kind of, how do you say yeah. how to hope, how do you cope with it? I guess. Bottom line, you have to learn how to manage your mind. So you need to understand what kinds of thinking loops you tend to get stuck in and you need to learn strategies for like how you can overcome that. There was some like a really cool study and, and I I didn't read it. Like somebody told me about it years after, I think it was like after the Athens Olympics EA came. And uh and it was about like looking at these Olympic athletes who show up and they're totally the dark horse. Like nobody expects anything from them. And then all of a sudden they go out there on like the day that it really, really matters and they break all of their personal best records. And what's different about them than everybody else? So they did like zillions of psychological tests on these people to figure out what set them apart. And what set them apart was the ability to lie to themselves and believe it when they needed to. Wow. So so they had to go out there and they had to say to themselves, I am the best freaking shot put athlete ever. (laughs) And I am going to, I am going to throw this humongous rock like faster than or further than anybody's ever thrown it before and totally buy into that and believe that. And then all of a sudden they would execute these record-breaking performances that they'd never come close to previously. And, and I think that as an adult amateur, like you need to be aware of what is my tendency with my anxiety or my thoughts on show day? And, and what, can I, what can I do to overcome that? Because you, you can control your emotions completely if you learn to control your thoughts. Like your emotions are a result of your thoughts. So if you realize that you're saying to yourself, you know, oh, you know, everybody's watching me and they're going to think that I'm like, I look like, I look ridiculous or like, I'm totally embarrassing myself. Then, you you know, you might have to look for some evidence about that and remember, you know, recall the stuff that we talked about earlier, like your preparation and, and all this sort of stuff, like fight it, fight this, this stuff with logic. And then you can actually start to come up with, like, not so much a mantra. I don't want this to sound like 1970s, like, <laughs> write it on your mirror with lipstick. <laughs> but, but hey, come up with a, not a, judging. <laughs> <laughs> not that I've ever suggested that. <laughs> Eyeliner works better. 
you you might like actually Good go point. and and put in the time of creating a thought that that heads off that kind of thinking or that like tends to nip it in the bud. Find something that feels true and believable to you and that helps you to feel pumped up in the moment instead of intimidated or it helps you feel excited instead of nervous. So like find the emotion that's going to help you in that moment rather than one that's going to be uh, you know deleterious and then come up with thoughts that are going to cultivate that emotion for you. I love that. That's great. So I have just one last question before we move on to our next topic. That is something we haven't covered yet. And it's sort of the, the fear and sadly when tragedy strikes, like how to get over some of those anxious feelings. And this question is from, let's see here, let me make sure I'm reading the right one, from Elizabeth. So she had to do an emergency dismount and she managed to break her ankle on the landing. She lost that horse to colic before she was cleared to ride again. Now she has another horse, a new mare who is very similar in breeding to her gelding that she lost, but she has this fear of coming off again and breaking something so she can ride her. And and this mare has never done anything to intimidate her but she just has a hard time getting past those feelings that are going on in her head and those thoughts that say, what if you come off and get hurt again? What if you can't afford to miss work now that you have a son that you didn't have last time, all those what ifs. So how do you get past that? I mean, that's a clearly very emotional and Elizabeth, I'm so sorry you lost your horse too. Oh God. What a, like what a terrible, like, set of uh, events like the timing of it sorry yeah like over and over again but (laughs) um yeah the timing's just terrible and when that that you know series of uh, a a tragic or traumatizing event and then you know developing a lot of anxiety about similar things like that that can develop into post-traumatic stress disorder and and what we know about helping people who've been through a trauma is that over time if you can methodically and gradually reintroduce them to the you know stimuli that are similar to whatever it was that they went through and kind of like build up from an exposure point of view gradually to the stuff that was scary but previously you can teach them to you know relaxation exercises that they can use in the moment and to combat that anxious feeling and then you kind of ramp it up and ramp it up and ramp it up and it it takes time and it takes patience but every day that she rides her new horse and that kind of stuff doesn't happen that's that's positive exposure, right? And she's going to be able to build on that to undo all those negative associations and eventually find like, you know, peace and enjoyment in her riding. Good points. We hope the best for you, Elizabeth, for sure. Mm-hmm. Ugh. And hugs too, because man, yes. that sucks. Totally hugs. So I just had to mention about the Equian style shirts because I have fallen in love with their summer shirts their, you know, winter shirts, their, all of their shirts, but I did not know one thing that you could actually customize them until we got the shirts from heels down and figured out that you could actually get them to customize them with your logo, with your barn name, with anything else. And so we have the blue ones with white and they have different fonts and everything that you can kind of choose from and like different styles. So you guys should check it out. It is on Equi in style.com slash custom dash shirts. All right. So we are back and we're ta- now we're going to talk still medical topics. It's like our medical <laughs> segment, I guess, or a medical episode. So Dr. Gabby Ledgler is still with us. And um, <laughs> Sanji we're... Gupta, the medical correspondent. <laughs> right. <laughs> we are transitioning from anxiety. And now we're going to talk about why equestrians have this terrible reputation of going against medical advice. Um, I feel like some of it is like this cultural phenomenon within our own, you know, our own equestrian groups of like, we're tough. We've got grit. You know what I mean? Like, Oh, I'm fine. I'm getting back on like we're hockey players or something, but we're not, you know, (laughs) but so I wanted to, Gabby, I wanted you to talk about this and just you too, because you're someone who had an injury in between like major competitions and, like, how do you handle that? Because at one point, like, obviously, you're never going to get better and you're going to be weak. And how are you going to be an effective rider if you're riding when you're not fully healed? But but there's also that, you know, that panic, I feel like, that people deal with. Well, like, I can't go six weeks and not be in the saddle. So well, I think that's it. You panic that you can't be six weeks in the saddle and actually 
go to your competition. So as upper level, <laughs> like riders, we panic and say, look, like if you're telling me I'm out for six weeks, well, our next big competition is always weeks away. Like it is days, weeks away. You have to get in the saddle. The more time you're out, you're getting weaker. And so, you know, I think a lot of them go in for surgery right away and they say, Hey, look, we're going to get the surgery. Surgery fixes it fast and you can be on. And I have friends that are, you know, broken collarbones on within two weeks and no problem. And I'm a little bit of a different situation, I guess you'd say. So for the listeners, my dad is actually, um, he's a neurosurgeon and my mom <laughs> is a nurse. And so I would love to fall into that category of like, guess what? The doctor said, I'm doing X, Y, and Z. I'm doing this. I would probably be shot, honestly, like, or pulled off the horse or all of this. And so a lot of this is not a personal like preference. This is just my life preference because my dad tells me I have to, and he'd probably come just kill me. I say, so, you know, when people say, Oh, how long did you ride when you were pregnant? I'm like, when my mom and dad told me I had to, basically I'm 30, I'm 34 years old and I still have to listen to them basically. So <laughs> I feel like I get no choice, but when my collarbone happened, uh, I called my dad. I saw the break. Um, we had x-rays sent to my dad's friends that are surgeons to fix my collarbone. They said, guess what? You know, I think we can do surgery tomorrow. Doug drove me through the night. I didn't eat. I prepped myself for surgery. Basically. Mm -hmm. I like had completely everything under control and I showed up. I said, okay, I'm ready to get put under and get surgery. Cause everybody tells me that's the fastest way I'm going to go. And my dad said, we've decided against that. And I threw the biggest fit and still lost. Just saying, I, they told me you can be riding in two weeks. And I said, it better be two weeks, a week and like a couple days go by. I started screaming at everybody. Cause I thought there's no way I'm going to ride. I'm in so much pain. They told me two weeks. I have only two weeks off because I have Rolex and all of this coming up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I called my doctor. I screamed. I called my dad. I screamed. It got so bad. My mom and husband left the house and left me like as a two-year-old child, like throwing a temper tantrum <laughs> on the front. And I couldn't move. I was in so much pain. And I was like, you guys told me. And like, I was horrible, horrible patient, but they like, wouldn't let me do anything. Like I couldn't ride. I couldn't do anything. So I'm a little jealous of the people that say, screw it. I'm just going to do whatever because I don't get that luxury. <laughs> Aww. Well, when I, I think about it from an amateur perspective and like, obviously there's no repercussions to my livelihood. If I yeah. break my leg, I can still wheel myself or use my crutches to drag my broken body <laughs> into the office and continue to work. But, yeah. but I feel yourself into your chair. <laughs> Okay. My, like my life would not like suffer, you know, I could still feed my horse and get a paycheck, but I, um, mentally, absolutely. If I couldn't ride for six weeks, I'd be going crazy in my head. You know what I mean? I would, it would just, it becomes such a, it's such a part of your everyday life. You know what I mean? The sport, this lifestyle that it would drive me crazy. And I'm sure a lot of, I feel like that's a lot of, like the reason why a lot of amateurs get back into the saddle probably before they're, they're ready to, have you heard of that, Gabby, or just? 100%. 100%, yeah. Okay. And actually, a, an amateur eventing friend of mine who's also a physician, like, just broke her arm in the fall, um, and she needed surgery, and it was plated and all that, and she cool. was a, she was lunging again in two weeks and riding on, on the third week, and she just basically said that she and her surgeon had an understanding. <laughs> and, and I... <laughs> They do. They make up like, these understandings, though. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> totally. It's like the doctor to doctor understanding is this is this is the actual risk. Like this is what could go wrong if you disobey yes. my recommendations. But you're balancing that with like, you know, this is this is what I am maybe for a lot of riders. So, you know, it's not like a sport that you do. It's a you become a rider. Or, Absolutely. You know, if you're a professional, it's your livelihood. And and 
So you're always, you're making your own decision based on weighing, you know, the risks and the benefits for you specifically rather than for broken arms in general. My coach broke her foot a couple of years ago, like a, a horse spooked and like jumped on her foot basically and broke her navicular bone. Uh, oh, people have that's one a terrible <laughs> one. No, my yeah. sister-in-law broke it and they had to basically threaten her like that she wanted to get in the saddle really quickly. And the same thing that the doctor threatened her and said, look, this is a like actual huge problem. You can't get on for X amount of weeks yeah. or you could do personal da- like permanent damage. So that's what, that's the position my coach was in too. So you could have a non-union, you know, a heel yeah. fracture that's not healing together. And, and it's one of those small finicky bones with surrounded by lots of soft mm-hmm. tissues that can get really angry and painful over time. But she wasn't in a position to be able to like feed her family if she wasn't riding. Mm-hmm. So she rode without stirrups for two months. <laughs> wow. We got back in the tag, but, you know, she couldn't push on the stirrup or put any weight on the stirrup. And, and um, that's the decision. That's the calculation she had to make based on, like, what was the risk she was looking at if she took the doctor's advice versus if she didn't. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So and now I, both of you have children, too. And I know a lot of women choose to ride through their pregnancy. And I know that's a little different, obviously, like you're that's another life you're supporting, right? So that's, mm-hmm. it's not just your decision, but is that something Jess and, and you, Gabby, that you guys had to like really think and consider and make a plan when you were pregnant? Um, yeah, for me, I probably didn't tell my parents how long I really rode, like probably lied by about a month, honestly, um, <laughs> because <laughs> forgot, it's, so, <laughs> it's forgetting not, not lying. <laughs> I forgot. I I <laughs> forgot. I didn't lie. I forgot to tell them. But yeah. So for me, I stopped competing right away. Like that was a no brainer. I wasn't going to put that risk. Um, I had a preliminary horse, a young one that I just bought over in Ireland. So I, and all my training horses, I kind of gave off and said, Hey, look, I'm going to not compete at all. And my preliminary horse actually went on maternity leave with me. And I didn't ride him at all. And then I rode very few. And honestly, I didn't show for a long time. So I, I mean, with my first baby and everything, that's kind of quite normal. So I talked to a lot of my doctor friends and my parents and everything that said, look, like if he's still in my pelvis, then it's probably pretty safe. So I rode, I think till I was like five months pregnant. But Doug had had his bad accident at that time. So I actually rode probably two weeks longer than what I initially planned because it was our livelihood and we had to keep going. And so I ended up jumping, not very big, but ended up having to jump a couple of the horses just to keep their footwork going. Honestly, a little bit longer than I think I thought I was going to, but it it was the same thing. It was, these horses have to keep going and nobody else is there to jump them that we trusted. So I did it. And so I was lucky that it turned out in our favor, but it was kind of one of those situations that we had never planned on, but Doug was completely out with a broken collarbone. Wow. Yeah. So I have two kids and with the first one, I rode until five or six months. Um, And it was a pain thing that when I stopped in the end, like the front of my pelvis had gotten, uh, like really loose and and that joint there, that cartilage joint was super painful. So I, I stopped when I did, but I went into that decision knowing that, yeah, that the fetus is really well protected within the pelvis for the first trimester, at least, especially with the first pregnancy. Yeah. And, um, you know, short of a really significant injury, like a pelvic fracture or something. Yeah. 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 Pretty safe. And then I, I decided to play it by ear, like based on how I felt. Um, and I had two youngish horses at the time. I had a four-year-old and a five-year-old, I think, or a five and a six-year-old uh, when I had my first. Um, and I stopped riding at about five months just due to pain. And then with my second, I found my balance shifted pretty early in the pregnancy. And I broke my foot. And <laughs> like 
the dumb stuff happened. And so I was, I was out by about four months. So like, you're not that long after you just called it a day. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I suck. <laughs> I'm done. I'm calling it yeah, a day. Yeah. I'm Peace. done. <laughs> I'll be back in a year. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but, but again, I like my plan was to play it by ear. And I, and I think so. Yes. A lot of um, physicians will kind of say, limit high risk sports or contact sports, you know, don't ride. But then there's that extra discussion about, you know, if riding is a big part of your life, if riding is something that your body is used to, like you can temper all of that advice with a little bit of like, how does it apply to you specifically? Absolutely. Um, Like mine, actually, my physician told me not to take up CrossFit. Because it, I yeah. was something I was not very good at. Like I would yeah. not you don't do it. Have a baby and so on she said, <laughs> "No." So Gosh. she said, "Don't take up CrossFit or anything like that. Your body's used to what you've been doing." And so she was happy that I quit when I did. But at the same time, she was actually more against me doing some kind of high intensity workout because um, don't do that. <laughs> so <laughs> she was like. This would actually probably send your body into more shock. <laughs> I I ended up having to go to the uh, like the labor and delivery unit for like 24 hours of monitoring, not because I did something dumb in the barn, but like two weeks before I was due with my second, I decided to try and hang a picture while leaning over a chest of drawers and like wiped out right on my back. Oh no. <laughs> Jeez. So I like wrecked myself way more doing like nesting activities. Nesting activities. Riding. You're like, I would have been safer riding my horse just FYI. Yeah. It's funny. <laughs> so anyways, so I guess if we were going to like give someone some advice, you should really listen to your doctor, right? At the end of the day, <laughs> they know what's and, best for you. And it, and ask that question, like, the say your doctor says, I don't want you doing this or that for eight weeks. Ask the question, like, what could go wrong if I did do that? Your, your doc- it doesn't matter if your doctor judges you. <laughs> <laughs> They're still going to do their best to care for you. Mm-hmm. But, but you need to know why that's being recommended. And if that's not a reason that's significant enough for you to prevent you from riding, then you're going to ma- take that risk or make that uh, calculation. That's really good advice. Yeah. And don't ever do it when it's a head injury. No, no. You take risks with every other organ system. Like the further it is away from your head, the more, I don't care if you chance it, but when it's a concussion, then it's potentially life or death and potentially very, very serious disability. If you don't listen to medical advice. So anything but your noggin. And, and yes, and not because your friend had three concussions, like, you know, they don't know how many is too many per individual situation. So yes, please listen to your doctor on that. And even if you Mm -hmm. fall off and don't get diagnosed with a concussion, if there's even like some reasonable doubt that you hit your head, you really need Mm -hmm. to take that seriously. Be smart. Absolutely. I actually, like I'm, despite being a doctor, I can be really dumb sometimes but, but I actually, like, managed to fall off and get a, a nothing bump on the head a few years ago. Uh, and I didn't really think anything of it. And so I went to a show that weekend, and I managed to fall off three more times at one show. Um, because I was actually concussed, and I didn't yeah. realize. Wow. It was, it was the next Monday while I was driving to work, and I drove up to an intersection. Oh. And I'm like, shit, I can't remember what to do with this color light. That's when it hit me. Oh, oh my gosh. gosh. Yeah. That's so scary. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, so like, just don't underestimate how significant any bump on the head can be. No, and, absolutely. And be on the lookout for those signs. You know, I, I think I am constantly burnt out. So I wasn't paying attention to the fact that I felt maybe especially tired or especially distractible in the days between that lesson when I wiped out and that show that I went to. Mm-hmm. But yeah, wow. any bump on the head is something you got to pay attention to. Well, Dr. Gabby Ledger, we're so glad you joined us. This is like a super interesting conversation. So thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks for inviting me. It was super fun. Thanks. <laughs> and uh, let me know if you guys do some more mental health type stuff. But it was fun hanging out and chatting. Absolutely. Totally. We'd love you back on. Thank you. Cool. So it's that time. It's Rose and Thorn. Justine, are you ready? 
I'm ready, but you need to go first. Okay, I'll go first. So I'm going to kind of cheat because mine's kind of the same, but it's like <laughs> the best rose and thorn together kind of thing. Okay. So my rose part of it, it's like a two-parter. My rose part of it is that I went to my first event back. Like I did a jumper show and that was good. That I went to my first event back and I didn't take my preliminary horse. I took my young Irish horse. Aww. And I, w- I went training level. I thought that was like pretty good to go back training yeah. level. Yeah. Are you kidding me? I haven't competed in two years. So I, I was know. like hoping my white breeches fit, which <laughs> they did. So that actually in itself should be my rose, but <laughs> um, all my clothes fit. I was real proud of that. And I went and I was really good. Like I had a good dressage score. I had one rail because this horse has like a bit of a shorter step than my other ones. And so I was like, like, oh, six will be normal. And I was like, oh no, I probably should have added. So it was like a little bit late communication, but he jumped everything else. Awesome. awesome. I go cross country and here's getting to my thorn. I go cross country. He is awesome. And Doug's like, he will be pretty good. Like Doug's been riding him. And so he's like, he'll be pretty good. Like, you know, he'll he'll be fine. He might like kind of just start off, like maybe looking at a couple fence. He didn't look anything. He was beautiful. Like I was a hunt around and this is where the thorn comes in. I thought it was pretty speedy and I've been known to be kind, okay, a lot slow on cross country. Um, <laughs> okay. So I come in and I'm like, I forgot to watch first. And I was like, oh my gosh, I was so good. And I was like, I think I was pretty fast. Like I took some inside turns and I think I was moving along. Like I did have to set up probably, I didn't need to, but, but I kind of set up between the fences a little bit. Like, but I think I was still moving. And, and I even made a point. I think the person behind me is like pretty far behind me. So like, I got to be pretty good. Right. <laughs> okay. Here's my thorn. The score came in. I had 17 time penalties at the training level. Oh my gosh. What happened? That's like, that's like 45 seconds. I have no idea. <laughs> that's 45 seconds. <laughs> What happened was I thought I was moving a lot slower. I was, I thought I was moving a lot faster than I really was. You were just having a nice leisurely ride. It's your first cross country in a while. You know, come on. I think I was going for a leisurely ride. Like I thought I was moving along. You got to get that gallop back in you. (laughs) Well, this is the worst part. Everybody, it's been pretty great. Everybody's like, so it's just because you had a baby and like all this. my, My coach was in town. She asked me how it went. And I go, actually, you should guess. She goes, let me guess. She had time penalties cross country. And I go, yep. She goes, like, a couple. And I go, yeah, like, a couple 17, right? And she, like, her, <laughs> her mouth dropped. And then going, everybody keeps blaming on the kid. She goes, you should just smile and nod and take that. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> because in her mind, she's so embarrassed that I literally haven't gotten any better that I still have time penalties all the time. Oh, it's so depressing. <laughs> You'll get there. Don't worry. Did you listen to I her? I've ep- gone there in like 30 years. Oh my God. You'll get there. You'll get back. Don't worry. It's only been two years. You'll work your way back. The problem was, if you look at my record two years ago, there still were probably five time penalties at training level. <laughs> Hey, did you listen to our episode with Courtney and Alex? She was so good. Yes, it was so Wasn't good. She? Yeah, oh my yes. gosh. You were my oh rose God. last week, though, because I was I so did. excited to see you ride. I'm so happy that you're back. I know. So. <laughs> so but, funny. But yes, Courtney was the best. She's yes. Got, she definitely has to come back. She's a fan favorite already. So she, She's great. Totally great. So, so All right. So funny. All right, my rose. Let's is, hear yours. So my rose is that I'm going to our horse show this weekend. I'm really excited. It's um, it's sort of a bigger horse show for my green horse. So I'm I'm a, I'm a little nervous. You know, like I hope we don't mess up. You know, like I want to actually look good and do well. Like he's he's doing pretty well for the most part. You know, like his training wise. Um, I feel really good about how he's progressing. So. We're going to try a bunch of different things. Like we're riding in the Eck and the Hunters and the Jumpers because I still don't know what he likes to do. So we'll see how he does and all three. Yeah, but that would be perfect. Yeah, I'm excited. No pressure. Like whatever he does, we'll do. But um, 
I feel proud of where he is right now. You know what I mean? Like I feel like I'm full of pride of the work we've put in. So I feel ready for this horse show. Um, the, my thorn, it also has to do with him because so is life with an OTTB uh, out of nowhere in the last, not so much the last two weeks, but like three weeks ago, out of nowhere, this damn horse all of a sudden started losing weight super fast and we could not figure out what was going on. Like, how was he losing weight so fast? His hindquarters were getting all sucked in. His hips were all sunk in. We couldn't figure out what was happening because he held his weight beautifully for so long. So I had the vet come out. They looked at his mouth, made sure there was nothing wrong with his teeth. He had recently been floated. We wormed him. The vet ran blood work. Uh... We gave him more hay. Like I paid more more money and board to buy like better hay for him just for a short period of time to see if he just needed more like nutrient dense hay. Nothing was helping. And then you want to know what he did? What well, like what? What like what the damn problem was? Is my, all right. My horse is a cribber. Yeah. So he wears a collar, but when he goes out to pasture, we take the collar off because everything is electric. So there's nothing for him to grab. Well, my damn horse found the one post, one little sliver no. of a post that the electric does not touch. And he just, because it's winter, we have less grass. He yeah. cribs all night on that little post. All night. So, just cribs, oh, cribs all, all I did was need his cribbing collar. Yep. So, and it's amazing. I wish I could lose weight as fast as he could lose weight. It's crazy. You know what I mean? He drops. Please, so much- please don't try by cribbing on some wood. <laughs> Right. I don't really want to know how that works out. I don't know. I'm not going to try. Don't worry. <laughs> I'm a I'm a kid who grew up on braces. I'm not going to ruin these teeth. Perfect. So. Perfect. <laughs> but anyways, now he has to wear his cribbing collar in the in the field. So he's basically in it 24 seven and he hates his new life. But he put the weight back on really fast once we figured out what the problem was. Right. It was like instant. <laughs> yeah. Instant overnight. He was like all of a sudden putting weight back on. Ah, horses, right? Horses, that's exactly it. So Jess, we have a mailbag, and I feel like I don't have a ton of insight for this person, so I'm hoping you you will. So Eric wrote to us, and he said, when you're looking at off-the-track horses, what are the biggest things you have learned to watch out for and maybe steer clear of uh, regarding the horse's build that may possibly possibly affect or improve or inhibit their performance. I'm also curious if you have any, any tips or advice on approaching owners and trainers about their horses uh, that they might be looking to retire right off the racetrack. Do the owners seem to take the inquiry about the horse kindly or as ignorant or even nosy? So just um, let's start with the confirmation stuff. Like when you're looking at thoroughbreds, what are you, what are you looking for? So for confirmation, like you kind of want to think, for me, I don't want something super long in the back because then it tends to have like kind of, and this is all just very vague and like gist of it. But if they're too long back, they end up having like kind of back issues or they're harder to kind of compress and everything. So I like them to have like a bit of a shorter back. I don't mind if they're next a bit on the longer side because that usually helps with like better balance and like jumping but I also want them to be built a bit uphill. Like you don't want them built down. Like you don't want their butt higher than their withers, if that makes sense. Yeah. And so I do look for like kind of a good confirmation, make sure they look kind of the part that you don't have one leg a bit crooked. You want their legs to be straight. You don't want the, you know, basically if you look at them and they're kind of put together, well, that's always a good thing. You don't want feet to be kind of different shapes, different sizes. You want them to both be very similar. So sometimes they have a bit flatter feet, which when you're talking about like, what can you live with? Like sometimes their feet can be a bit flatter if you have like a good farrier kind of thing, or, you know, I don't really love like lubby feet type thing. And then I always, even if the horse is free, do a basic vetting, like hands down. Cause you want to make sure there's not like any pre-existing conditions where they've like had a strain in their tendon or suspense, like suspensories or anything in their ligaments. You don't want any of that because a lot of that is going to be just a maintenance nightmare. And so you find a vet that you trust and get them to go do like kind of a basic pre-purchase and find out exactly like what you're dealing with, because I feel like knowledge is everything. So if you know what you're dealing with ahead of time, it's easier to manage. And is it livable? 
Yeah, so that's my next question for you. So uh, it's hard to find a horse that will pass a pre-purchase, like 100% flying colors, no issues. So what's something like that you've seen with an off-the-track horse that you can live with? Like what are things? If they they have like kind of like some OCD spurs or whatever else and your vet's like, look, this isn't probably going to be a problem or you can remove them very easily. Mm -hmm. It usually costs like depending on what area you're in, it's not that much money to remove it and like their ankles or something. So kind of that sort of thing. But I, I'm more interested on how they flex. So are they flexing? Well, if they're flexing like three-legged lame and you take a picture of them and it doesn't look good, probably steer clear of it. Right. So like their flexions tell you something and then their x-rays tell you something. So I always start with flexions and then, so I don't run up a huge vet bill. I go, okay, let's flex them. If the left front flex is a little bit weird, I'll take a picture of them. If it looks weird, like it could just be that day, you know, maybe it's a hot nail, maybe it's blah, blah, blah. So I take that information, put it towards that. And I find a really good vet that I trust and I kind of go with their thing. Cause I have to tell you my, um, he raced over in Australia, but my advanced horse was a thoroughbred. I bought him. He had done one preliminary level. He has the most ugly ankle. He got wrapped up in wire. His ultrasound looks like he has the super, like the superficial is four times what it should look like. And so I consulted like my really good vet and they said it will never you're going to have a million different problems with the source. If it goes advanced, it's not going to be one of them. Sure enough, that never bothered him. He's 22 years old, completely sound, happy, like down in Florida competing with one of our clients. And so I did exactly that. I trusted my vet and he was like, look, he flexes great. This doesn't bother him. We'll be fine. And we didn't. So that's kind of my advice. Awesome. I think that's perfect. Well, good luck, Eric. If you have any more questions, You should definitely post in the Heels Down Happy Hour podcast lounge on Facebook. We've got a lot of really wonderful listeners who post in there all the time, and they probably have some advice that they could share as well. But if you want to send us a question, please post in the Facebook group, or you can also send us an email at hello at heelsdownmedia.com. And if you want to hear more from us, you should really subscribe to the Heels Down Brief. Again, you can do that at bit.ly slash hdbrief. And we want to thank this week's sponsors, Pup and Pony Co. and Equa in Style. All right, Jess, that's it. That's a wrap. Yay. Cheers. Cheers.